Good day. So for this session, I am to discuss about enzyme measurements. So in this topic, I will tackle about some of the medically important enzymes and of course, their clinical significance and some of the tests that are used in their detection. So for the learning objectives, at the end of this lesson, you are all expected to define the term enzyme, including physical composition and structure. Next, determine the different factors affecting the rate of an enzymatic reaction. And lastly, determine the tissue sources, diagnostic significance, and assays, including sources of error for medically important enzymes. So first, let us define what is an enzyme. So they are specialized proteins. So as a protein, enzymes have specific amino acid sequence or what we learned in clinical chemistry 1 as their primary structure. And of course, with the resultant polypeptide chains twisting into a secondary structure, then folding as a tertiary structure and eventually forming a quaternary structure. So you will see this structures of enzyme as you learned about the different sites in an enzyme, particularly the active site, and of course, the other structures of the enzyme. And also, they hasten the chemical reaction. So that means they served as a catalyst. So when we say catalyst, they speed up or again, they hasten the reaction. But you have to take note that Although, although this enzyme um, speed up the reaction, they do not alter the reaction. And also, one of the striking characteristics of an enzyme is that they are not consumed in the reaction. So in the laboratory, we don't measure their concentration or we don't measure their absolute values, but we measure enzymes based on their activity. And next one, they are normally confined within the cells unless membrane permeability allows them to enter the blood. But you also have to take note that there are certain enzymes, particularly those that facilitate coagulation, which are present in significant amount in plasma. And since these enzymes are um, normally found inside the cells, they frequently appear in the serum or in the plasma after cellular injury. Meaning to say, whenever there is a large amount of enzymes in the serum or plasma, that is a clinical evidence of an organ or cell damage. And next one, again, enzymes are measured based on their activity because again, they are not consumed in the reaction. So enzymes as catalysts have reaction specificity. So again, enzymes are specific biologic proteins that catalyze many specific physiologic reactions. And of course, these reactions are facilitated by the structure of the enzymes. And again, they only affect the rate of reaction because again, they are not consumed in the reaction. So what is happening is that these enzymes only affect the rate of the reaction by lowering the energy of activation. And of course, their activity is affected by temperature and pH. You have to go back to the basic that enzymes are proteins. So they will be denatured, especially if you use high temperature or there is any change in the pH of the reaction system. And of course, they contain an active site and an allosteric site. So an active site is the region within an enzyme that fits the shape of the substrate. And this active site is a water-free cavity. So this one, water-free cavity. And since this is a protein, again, it has this three-dimensional protein structure. So this is where the substrate interacts with particular charged amino acid residues. And of course, the shape and chemical environment inside this active site permit a chemical reaction to proceed more easily. And other than the active site, we have this term, allosteric site. So an allosteric site of an enzyme is a cavity other than the active site. So it could be here or in these areas. So other than the active site. And this allosteric site may bind regulator molecules. And so um, they are also important to the basic structures of the enzyme. And of course, again, this active site is specific to the substrate 
that it binds. So what is basically a substrate? So a substrate is a reactant that is activated by the enzyme. And as what I have mentioned, again, enzymes are specific to their substrates. And that specificity is determined by the active site. So this is the active site of an enzyme and the yellow structure there that is the substrate. And um, you have to take note that in an enzymatic reaction, the higher the enzyme concentration, so the higher the enzyme concentration, the faster the reaction. So just like for example, if we have six enzymes here, so... So this is four, five, and six enzymes. And we add two substrate. So as these substrates bind to their um, enzyme in their active site, the reaction will proceed at a higher rate or there is a higher rate of reaction because more enzyme is present to bind with the substrate. And with the amount of enzyme exceeding the amount of substrate, the reaction rate steadily increases as more substrate is added. So those substrate will continually bind to the active site of an enzyme. However, when the substrate concentration reaches its maximal value, so all the substrate, for example, has occupied the active site of an enzyme, the higher concentration of substrate will no longer result in an increased rate of the reaction. So that is what we call as saturation kinetics. So saturation kinetics. So because the enzymes present in the reaction system are already bound to their substrate. So that's basically the main principle when we talk about the active site and of course the substrate. So how can enzymes speed up the rate of reaction? Because we said they are catalysts. So they hasten the reactions. So now let's compare the chemical reactions and the enzymatic reactions. So in chemical reactions, as what you can see here, it needs an initial input of energy, this activation energy. So normally, this activation energy can be done by increasing the temperature in the system because the increased temperature will make the molecules move faster. So um, during this part of the reaction, the molecules are said to be in transition state so from lower energy to higher energy activation by increasing the temperature that's for chemical reactions and for an enzyme controlled pathway or reaction the enzymes can increase the rate of reactions without increasing the temperature so how can the enzymes do this so as what you can see in the figure the enzymes can do this by lowering the activation energy so as compared to this one, in enzymatic reaction, there is a lower energy activation. So in such a way, the enzyme can create a new reaction pathway. So here, or this is a shortcut. So that is also the reason why in the enzyme-controlled reactions, it can proceed about 108 to 111 times faster than the corresponding non-enzymatic reactions. That's why we call enzymes as catalyst. Now let us have the factors affecting enzymatic reactions. So we have here the enzyme concentration and also the substrate concentration, the cofactors and inhibitors, isoenzymes, temperature, hydrogen ion concentrations, and lastly, the storage. So as what I have mentioned earlier, the higher the concentration of the enzyme, the faster the rate of the reaction because again, more enzyme is present to bind with the substrate. And of course, um, the reaction rate steadily increases as more substrate is added. However, when the substrate concentration reaches its maximal value, the higher concentration of the substrate no longer result in the increased rate of reaction. Again, we call it a saturation kinetics. So that is how the enzyme and the substrate affect the rate of the reactions. And also, we have what we call as cofactors. So cofactors are non-protein entities. So remember, enzymes are proteins. So cofactors are non-protein entities and they have to bind to the enzyme before a reaction occurs. So in short, 
these cofactors help in the activation of enzyme. That is the opposite of inhibitors because inhibitors inhibit the activity of an enzyme. So for cofactors, we have three, the coenzyme, the activators, and metalloenzymes. So you have the mnemonics there, the COM. So first, let's have the coenzymes. So coenzymes, you have to take note that they are organic compounds. So again, these are cofactors. Coenzymes are organic cofactors that um, increasing its concentration will increase the velocity of an enzymatic reaction. So um, these cofactors um, usually is essential to achieve absolute enzymatic activity. So examples of coenzyme, we have um, nicotinamide, adenine, dinucleotide, and we also have certain vitamins and of course the flavin, adenine, dinucleotide. And also, you have to take note about this term, prosthetic group. So this one, prosthetic group. So a coenzyme, if it is attached to an enzyme portion, we call as apoenzyme, um, they form an active system called as a holoenzyme. So again, when a coenzyme is tightly bound to a part of an enzyme, which is an apoenzyme, so we call it as a prosthetic group. And together, they form a complete and active um, system called as the holoenzyme. So that means a holoenzyme is equal to a prosthetic group. Again, this prosthetic group is a coenzyme that is tightly bound to a part of an enzyme we call as an apoenzyme. So that is the term, uh, the meaning of the terms there. And next one, we have the activators. So activators, as opposed to your coenzymes, they are inorganic ions. So inorganic ions, and they alter the configuration of the enzyme. So they alter the configuration or the shape of the enzyme so that the, the substrate could bind um, properly to the enzyme. And um, examples of these activators, we have calcium, we also have zinc, um, chloride, we have also magnesium, potassium, iron, manganese, and other electrolytes. And these inorganic cofactors, we call this again as activators. Next one, metalloenzymes. So they are also inorganic. So metallo enzymes. Just like your activators, they are also inorganic that is attached to a molecule. So examples of this, we have catalase and cytochrome oxidase. So examples of metalloenzyme, let me write, uh, let me write that one, catalase and cytochrome oxidase. So those are cofactors. How about this one, isoenzymes? So when we say isoenzymes, they have the same um, activity and they have also um, same properties with enzymes, but they exhibit different physical properties. So just like enzymes, they also hasten the chemical reactions. However, they have just some different physical properties. And um, also, they may have different amino acid sequences. So... For isoenzymes, particularly, they differ in enzymes based on electrophoretic mobilities. So electrophoretic properties and also they can exhibit different specificities for other substrate. So they could have different specificity and also they may differ from enzymes in their susceptibility to heat denaturation. So those are for isoenzymes. And how about for temperature? As mentioned earlier, temperatures and pH could alter or inhibit the activity of the enzymes. And you have to take note that enzymes are active at this temperature. We have 25 degrees Celsius. We also have 30 degrees Celsius and 37 degrees Celsius. And the most optimum temperature for enzymatic activity 
is 37 degrees Celsius. So that's the most optimum temperature for enzymes. Next one, how about the rate of denaturation? So the enzymes um, can be denatured as the temperature increases and usually it is significant at 40 to 50 degrees Celsius. So that's for denaturation. How about for inactivation? So the enzymes will be, render in, will be rendered inactive if the temperature reaches 60 to 65 degrees Celsius. So that's for the temperature. And again, the enzymes are very sensitive to temperature. That's why we have this term, the Q10. So this one, Q10. So that is a temperature coefficient that for every 10 degree increase in temperature, there will be a two-fold increase in enzyme activity. So meaning to say, increasing the temperature will increase the enzymatic activity. But again, um, significant temperatures like 40 to 50 degrees will denature the enzymes. And 60 to 65 degrees Celsius will inactivate the enzymes. So that's for temperature. How about the hydrogen ion concentration? So for hydrogen ion concentration, um, most physiologic reactions occur in the pH range of 7 to 8. So 7 to 8 pH. And again, enzymes are affected by pH level. So extreme pH level may also denature an enzyme or may influence its ionic strength or ionic state. So what will happen is the structure of an enzyme may change or there might be a change in the charge of amino acid residue in the active site of an enzyme. And lastly, we have the storage. So for storage, low temperatures such as refrigeration or freezing, they can render the enzymes reversibly inactive. And for this one, negative 20 degrees Celsius, this temperature is used for preservation of enzymes for a longer period of time. Also, we have 2 to 8 degrees Celsius. So this one, this is ideal for storage temperature for substrate and coenzymes. So that's 2 to 8 degrees Celsius. And also, we have room temperature, particularly ideal for the storage of the enzyme lactate dehydrogenase, particularly the LD4 and LD5. So in addition to storage, you just have to remember that enzymes, whenever they are increased in plasma or serum, it could be an evidence of a cell damage or organ damage. That's why whenever there is hemolysis in the specimen, we can expect that the enzyme concentration is also increased. And also, lactescent or milky specimen will decrease the enzyme concentration. So those are for the factors affecting enzymatic reactions. Now, how about for the inhibitors? So unlike your cofactors, inhibitors reduce the rate of enzymatic reaction and they are usually specific and they work at low concentrations. So they could reduce the enzymatic reactions by blocking the enzymes, but they don't usually destroy the enzymes. So we have three types here, the competitive, non-competitive, and uncompetitive inhibitor. So let's have first the competitive inhibitor. So this type of inhibitor physically binds to the active site of an enzyme and it resembles the substrate just like this one so we have here the enzyme and this one we have here the substrate so as what you can see we have here a triangular shape that fits to the active site of the enzyme for a competitive inhibitor just like this one so the shape really resembles the enzyme so that means both the substrate and the inhibitor compete for the same active site of the enzyme because again, the inhibitor resembles the substrate. So how can we reverse the inhibition? So the inhibition, its effect can be counteracted by adding excess substrate. So you have to add more substrate. And also, we could dilute the specimen like the plasma or the serum because um, by diluting the serum or the plasma, it could result to reduction in the concentration of this inhibitor. So we could increase the rate of the reaction. So that is for 
competitive inhibitor. Next one, non-competitive inhibitor. So this one, unlike your competitive inhibitor, it does not compete with the substrate because as what you can see here, non-competitive inhibitor is not structurally similar to the substrate. So it will not compete with the substrate um, on the active site of the enzyme. However, it will bind to the other site of the enzyme, this time to the allosteric site of the enzyme. And increasing the substrate concentration does not reverse the inhibition, just like in your competitive inhibitor. So in competitive inhibitor, when you increase the substrate, you reduce the inhibition. But in non-competitive inhibitor, increasing the substrate will not reverse the inhibition. Because again, the substrate and the inhibitor, usually the inhibitor here is a metallic ion, so they may bind the enzyme simultaneously. The substrate will be on the active site and the non-competitive inhibitor will be on the allosteric site of the enzyme. Next one, we have uncompetitive inhibitor. This type of inhibitor binds to the enzyme substrate complex. It does not bind to the active site, it does not bind to the allosteric site, but it will wait for the enzyme and substrate to bind to each other before it could bind to it. So it binds to the ES complex. So increasing the substrate concentration results in more ES complexes to which the in inhibitor binds and thereby increases the inhibition. So that means increasing the substrate concentration results to increase inhibition. So that is for uncompetitive inhibitor. Now let us have the enzyme nomenclature. So this one is mandated by the Enzyme Commission of the International Union of Biochemistry. So that was in 1961. But the standards in naming the enzyme or in these nomenclatures of the enzyme are revised in 1972 and in 1978. And the names of the enzymes are assigned based on the reactions they catalyzed. And also, we have here four digits usually used for the enzyme nomenclature. So the first digit refers to its class number. The second and third digit represents the subclass and the sub-subclass number of the enzyme. And the final or the fourth number now is a serial number that is specific to each enzyme. So generally, we have six classifications of enzymes, again, as mandated by the Enzyme Commission. So for the easy numbers, we have one to six. We have here the classes and the individual functions. So for easy number one, we have oxidoreductase. They catalyze the removal or addition of electrons. So that means they oxidize one substrate and reduce another. For easy number two, we have transferases. So they catalyze the transfer of a chemical group other than hydrogen to form one substrate to another. So by the name itself, transferases transfer a chemical group from one substrate molecule to another. Next one, EC number three, hydrolases. So they catalyze the hydrolysis or splitting of a bond by the addition of water. So that is what we call as hydrolytic reactions. Easy number four, lyases. So they catalyze removal of groups from substrate without hydrolysis as opposed to your hydrolases. And the product here contains a double bond. Next one, easy number five, isomerases. They catalyze the intramolecular arrangement of the substrate compound. So that means they move a chemical group from one point to another on a substrate molecule. And lastly, we have EC number six, the ligases. So they catalyze the joining of two substrate molecules coupled with breaking of the pyrophosphate bond in ATP or a similar compound. So in short, there is a bond formation between two groups of atoms with ATP as an energy source. So in order to remember this one, I usually give my students a mnemonic. So this one. So open the heaven, Lovelin is living. So that's for you to easily remember the classes of the enzyme. So open the heaven, Lovelin is living. 
And now we have here the examples for classifications of enzymes. So we have in oxidoreductase, the transferases, hydrolases, lyases, isomerases, and ligases. So you have here the specific enzymes. Now let us have the enzyme theories. So first we have the Emil Fischer's theory or the lock and key theory. So this one is based on the premise that the shape of the key, which is the substrate, must fit into the lock. So in this case, the enzyme. So the lock and key model portrays an enzyme as conformationally rigid and able to bond only to substrates that exactly fit the active site. So again, in this case, the active site has a rigid shape and only the substrates with matching shape can fit it, just like a lock and a key. So this one, this is a lock and key hypothesis. So the fit um, between the substrate, this one, and the active site of the enzyme is exact, like a key that fits into a lock very precisely, so this one. And the temporary structure called um, the enzyme substrate complex will be formed. And the products formed from the binding of substrate to the enzyme will have now a different shape from the substrate. And once formed, they are released, so the products are released from the active site, leaving the enzyme free to become attached to another substrate. So that is why the enzymes are not consumed in the reaction because they may again be used to bind to another substrate for a certain reaction to occur. So that's for the lock and key hypothesis. Next one, the Cochlans theory or the induced fit theory. So this one is based on the substrate binding to the active site of the enzyme and there is a greater range of substrate specificity in this theory because as opposed to your lock and key theory, in this case, the active site is flexible. It's not rigid. So the shape of the enzyme, the active site, and the substrate adjust to maximum fit. So that will now improve the catalysis. And also, um, the induced um, fit theory, to sum it up, portrays that the enzyme structure is more flexible and complementary to the substrate only after the substrate is bound. So that's why it has a greater range of substrate specificity because they adjust to a maximum fit. So in enzymatic reactions, we have the first order kinetics and the zero order kinetics. So I have illustrated this earlier wherein um, if we add substrates to an enzymatic reaction system, the substrate will readily bind to free enzymes at a low substrate concentration, where the amount of enzymes exceed the substrate, so the reaction rate will steadily increase as more substrate is added. So that is a first-order reaction in which the reaction rate is directly proportional to substrate concentration. However, as the substrate concentration reaches a high enough level to saturate all available enzymes, so remember the saturation kinetics, so the speed of the reaction will now reach its maximum level. And the reaction now will follow a zero-order kinetic model where the reaction rate is dependent on enzyme concentration. So that's the difference between the first order and the zero-order kinetics. So the following are reasons why we have elevated plasma enzyme levels. So number one is impaired removal of enzymes from plasma. Next, increased permeability of cell membrane. Increased in the number of cells or the production of cells. Increased in the normal cell turnover. Decreased clearance of enzymes from the circulation. And lastly, tissue necrosis and degeneration or the death of enzyme-containing cells. Now, for the methods of measurements of enzymes, we have particularly the colorimetric and ultraviolet. So, part of the ultraviolet are the manometry and fluorometry. So, between the two, the colorimetric and ultraviolet measurements, the colorimetric measurement is more cumbersome and usually it is less sensitive than the UV or the fluorometric method. And aside from that one, it requires a large amount of substrate and also longer incubation time and remember large amount of substrate could also act as an enzyme inhibitor and for the ultraviolet we have the manometry so this one measures the evolution of a gas or disappearance of a gas as the reaction proceeds 
For the fluorometry, we have this in clinical chemistry 1. So this is particularly useful in the differentiation between the oxidized and the reduced nucleotides. Because in fluorometry, the reduced nucleotides usually exhibit fluorescence, whereas the oxidized nucleotides do not fluoresce. So those are just some of the importance of the methods for measuring these enzyme levels. So enzymes are reported in international units. So that is unit per liter. So this international unit reflects the substrate utilized or the product formed or produced in terms of micromoles per minute per liter of blood or other body fluids under controlled conditions. And this international unit is the standard way of expressing enzyme activity because again, we measure enzymes based on their activity, not their absolute value. So all enzyme measurements are one of two kinds. We have the static or the fixed time, and we have the kinetic or the continuous. So for the static or fixed time, this is a measurement of a product or substance produced over a given period of time. So in the fixed time measurement, what we commonly do in the laboratory is that we combine all the reactants and we will uh, let the reaction proceed for a designated time and the reaction is now stopped and the measurement is made based on the reaction that has occurred so that means the larger the reaction the more enzyme is present so what we measure in the static or fixed time assay is the total amount of analyte that participate in the reaction for kinetic or continuous measurement this is a measurement of a substrate product per minute or hour produced constantly over a period of time. So this means we measure the difference in absorbance or activity between two points during the progression of the reaction. So that's basically the difference between a static or kinetic assay. Now let us have the clinically significant enzymes. So first we have the phosphatases. So under that, we have the alkaline phosphatase and the acid phosphatase. So both of them, they are belonging to class 3 enzymes. So they are classified as hydrolases. So first, we have the alkaline phosphatase. So the alkaline phosphatase has an easy number of 3.1.3.1. And by the name itself, its activity occurs optimally at pH 9. So pH 9, so that means the enzyme itself is inactive in the blood because we have a blood pH of 7.35 to 7.45. And also, this alkaline phosphatase splits the phosphorus. And you have to take note that phosphorus is an acid mineral. So when the ALP splits this one, it will create an alkaline pH. That's why the optimal pH of ALP is an alkaline pH, which is a pH of 9. And um, the major tissue sources for alkaline phosphatase are the bone, liver, intestinal, and placental tissues. And also, in healthy sera of the patients, the ALP levels are derived from the liver and also from the bone. And normally, um, children who are in their growing years and also the adults who are greater than 50 years old, we could see that their ALP, particularly the bone isoenzyme, are increased because of the osteoblastic activity of the bones. And also, you have to take note that zinc here is a necessary cofactor for ALP. That's why in patients with a deficiency in zinc, normally we could also see a decreased ALP. And if zinc is a cofactor, magnesium is the activator of ALP. And also, there are claims in which if you are a type B or type O individual, usually your ALP, particularly the intestinal ALP, will increase after consumption of a fatty meal. So that's for alkaline phosphatase. And the reference value for this one is 30 to 90 units per liter. And also, this alkaline phosphatase can be detected 16 to 20 weeks of normal pregnancy because the fetus is already growing 
in the womb of the mother. So this alkaline phosphatase is necessary for the bone development of the fetus. So the major isoenzymes of ALP include the bone, the liver, the intestinal ALP, and of course, the placental ALP. So what is actually measured in the blood is the total amount of alkaline phosphatases released from these tissues into the blood. And also, the primary importance of measuring alkaline phosphatase is to check the possibility of having a bone or liver problem. Because the mucosal cells that line the bile system of the liver are the main source of the alkaline phosphatase. So what will happen is the free flow of bile through the liver and down into the biliary tract and the gallbladder are responsible for maintaining the proper level of this enzyme in the blood. So what will happen is if the liver or the bile duct or the gallbladder system are not functioning properly or are blocked, this enzyme, the ALP, is not excreted through the bile and we could see an increased level of alkaline phosphatase in the blood. And also, in addition to liver problems, the elevated serum level of ALP can be due to rapid bone growth. So we could expect um, that growing children have higher levels of ALP than full-grown adults. So one of the techniques that is very helpful in the analysis of isoenzymes of ALP is the electrophoresis. And based on the electrophoretic mobility of ALP, we could see here that the one which migrates the fastest toward the anode is the liver ALP, whereas the slowest is the intestinal. So this one, this is the fastest, so this is the most anodal, followed by bone. And of course, we have the least anodal, we have the intestinal ALP. So based on the heat stability of ALP, we can see here that the placental ALP is the most heat stable of the four isoenzymes followed by the intestinal, liver, and bone. So the bone here is the most heat labile. And also, you have to take note that this placental ALP can resist heat denaturation at 65 degrees Celsius for 30 minutes. And also, talking about the placental ALP, we have here a fraction known as Reagan isoenzyme. So this one, this is a carcinoplacental ALP, so carcinoplacental ALP, which is considered as the most heat stable. And also take note that ALP is heat sensitive. So if stored at low temperature or let's say 4 degrees Celsius, it could lead to an increased serum or plasma ALP. And also, um, the heat stability for ALP is usually used to separate the isoenzymes, particularly the liver and the bone. So what is happening in this assay is that the ALP activity is measured before and after heating the serum at 56 degrees Celsius for about 10 minutes. So as a result, if the residual activity is less than the total activity before heating, then that is an indication that there is a presence of bone phosphatase or the bone ALP because again, this is the most heat labile. But if the residual activity is greater than 20%, so that could indicate a liver phosphatase or a liver ALP. So we also have here the different ALP isoenzymes in cancer patients. So first, we have again the Regan isoenzyme. So this one again, it's the most heat-stable carcinoplacental ALP. And this fraction is found in the lung, breast, ovarian, and gynecological cancers. Next one, we have the Nagao isoenzyme. So this one is found in the adenocarcinoma of pancreas and bile duct, and also in pleural cancer. Next, Kasahara isoenzyme. So this one, this is found in hepatoma. And for selective chemical inhibition of these ALP isoenzymes, we have the different chemicals that inhibit the different isoenzymes of ALP. So first, phenylalanine. So this phenylalanine inhibits the intestinal, the placental, and the Reagan ALP, and also the Nagao ALP. And take note also that Nagao ALP is inhibited by L-leucine. So there are two chemicals that inhibit the Nagao ALP, the phenylalanine and L-leucine. Also, 
the 3M urea inhibits the bone ALP. And not only that, because levamisole reagent also inhibits the bone ALP together with the liver ALP. So this table sums up the different methods used to determine ALP. So it shows here their substrate and their end product. So what I would want to emphasize here is the Bowers and Macomb because this one is considered as the reference method for ALP determination. So for Bowers and Macomb method, so this is a continuous monitoring technique based on the method devised by, of course, Bowers and Macomb that allows the calculation of ALP activity based on the molar absorptivity of the P-nitrophenol. So the substrate, again, the P-nitrophenyl phosphate, is colorless. So in the presence of ALP, it is hydrolyzed to P-nitrophenol and phosphate ions. So again, the end product of this method is a yellow compound. And the increase in absorbance at 405 nanometer at a pH of 10.15 is measured, and that absorbance is directly proportional to ALP activity. And again, this is the reference method for ALP determination. So as mentioned earlier, one of the main reasons why we measure ALP is in order to evaluate hepatobiliary disorders or any obstructive conditions in the liver and also any bone disorders. So for ALP, the highest elevation of which is seen in Paget's disease. So this one, this is a Paget's disease. So what you can see here are misshapen bones. So this Paget's disease, again, this is where we can see the highest elevation of ALP. So this disease is caused by excessive breakdown and formation of bone followed by disorganized bone remodeling. So that's why we can see increased level of ALP in the serum or plasma. So this one causes the affected bone to weaken, so the patients will experience pain. Again, there will be misshapen bones. Um, the patient could also experience fractures and arthritis in the joints near the affected bones. So the other name for Paget's disease is ostitis deformans. So again, this is where we can see the highest elevation of ALP. And other than that, we also have several conditions wherein we can see increased ALP levels. So we have obstructive jaundice. So this occurs when the essential flow of bile to the intestine is blocked and remains in the bloodstream. So ALP levels are increased. And this can be caused by a gallstone or by a tumor. And also we have rickets. So this is a disease in children caused by a lack of vitamin D. So this disease will cause the bone to soften or to bend. Also in adult. So this osteomalacia is analogous to rickets in children. So it also makes the bone to soften and to bend. And also we have osteoblastic um, bone tumors or osteosarcoma. We also have sprue. So this one, this is a digestive disease in which the small intestine's ability to absorb nutrients is impaired. So we could have fatty diarrhea and of course, again, malabsorption of nutrients. We also have hyperparathyroidism. So if we have hyperparathyroidism, then that means there is an excessive production of parathyroid hormone. So that now will cause excessive osteoclastic activity of the bone. So calcium will be released in the blood, but not only that, also the ALP will be released in the blood, increasing its value. And lastly, we have hepatitis and cirrhosis of the liver. Take note, there is only a slight increase of ALP in this condition because it's the mucosal cells that line the bile system of the liver which are considered as the source of the alkaline phosphatase. That's why in liver diseases, it's only slightly increased. So for the sources of error for ALP determination, of course, we have particularly the hemolysis. So this must be avoided because this might cause slight elevations of ALP because ALP is approximately six times more concentrated in RBCs than in serum. Also, ALP increases at 3 to 10% on standing at room temperature or 25 degrees Celsius or for 4 degrees Celsius for several hours. And also, as I have mentioned earlier, if you are a blood group 
B or O individual, after consumption of a high-fat meal or a high-fat diet, your ALP, particularly the intestinal ALP isoenzyme, will be increased. And also, the ALP is inhibited by phosphorus. So, um, we can use propanol to bind the phosphorus. So, this is particularly used in the reference method of ALP determination, the Bowers and Macomb method. So, next enzyme, we have the acid phosphatase. So, it has an easy number of 3.1.3.2. And as opposed to your alkaline phosphatase, it is optimally active at an acid pH. So, that is a pH of 5. And it catalyzes the same reaction made by alkaline phosphatase and the major tissue source of which is the prostate. But this is also very concentrated not only in the prostate but also in the human milk and also in the seminal fluids. And the other tissue sources for this one, we have the RBCs, the platelets, the liver, and the bone, just like your ALP. And the ACP activity of greater than 50 international units per liter indicates the presence of seminal fluid. So this one is very useful in forensic clinical chemistry in the investigation of rape cases because the vaginal washings are examined for seminal fluid and the ACP activity can persist for up to four days. So what's the clinical significance of acid phosphatase? So first, we have the detection of prostatic carcinoma or prostate cancer because after surgical treatment of prostate cancer, the ACP levels fall faster than the PSA. So PSA stands for prostate specific antigen and also the plasma levels of ACP are expected to be undetectable following complete removal of tumor. So in short, this prostatic ACP or what we call as the POP, we use this together with PSA to monitor the recurrence of prostate cancer. However, PSA is more sensitive than POP in detecting the early stages of prostate cancer, particularly the stages A and B of prostatic cancer. And also, for the medical legal evaluation of rape as detected in the vaginal walls following internal ejaculation during forcible penetration, and as what I have mentioned earlier, these vaginal washings are examined for seminal fluid activity of ACP and it can persist, the ACP activity can persist for up to 4 days. So other conditions with increased serum ACP, we have urinary tract obstruction, acute urinary retention, extensive prostatic massage, prostatic inflammation, infarction or ischemia, we also have prostatic manipulations, like in needle biopsy and cytoscopy. And increased ACP with metastatic involvement, we have here the prostatic carcinoma. Aside from that, the breast, the lungs, and thyroid cancers. We have the Gaucher's disease and the Neyman Peak disease. So this table shows the different ACP determination methods. So generally, we have four. And it shows also their substrate and the end product. So for Roy and Hillman, um, in particular, the substrate is thymolphthalein monophosphate, and this substrate is specific for prostatic ACP. And it's also the substrate of choice for quantitative endpoint reaction. So the end product for this method is a free thymolphthalein. Next one, Babson, Reed, and Phillips. So the substrate is alpha naphthyl phosphate, and the endpoint product is the alpha naphthol, and this one is preferred for continuous monitoring methods. For specimen considerations when handling ACP specimens, so the serum sample must be free from hemolysis. Again, one of the major tissue source of the ACP is the RBC, so any hemolysis will render the ACP to be increased. Another one, serum ACP decreases within 1 to 2 hours if left at room temperature and any delay in processing will cause a decreased activity of ACP because of the loss of carbon dioxide that increases the pH so that would decrease the ACP value and also if not assayed immediately serum should be frozen or acidified to a pH of 6.5 
and with acidification, the ACP is stable for up to 2 days at room temperature. Again, provided that it is acidified. Next one, we could also see a trap, so that is tartrate-resistant acid phosphatase in certain chronic leukemias and some lymphomas and most notably in hairy cell leukemia. And these are the chemicals that inhibit the ACP. So the L-tartrate inhibits the prostatic ACP and the copric sulfate and formaldehyde inhibit the RBC ACP. And also what I want to add is that the fluid collected from the vagina of a person on a cotton swab will still give a positive test for ACP if semen is present, provided that the med tech will use a stabilizing fluid with again an acidic pH. So next we have the transferases or transaminases. So we have the aspartate aminotransferase and the alanine aminotransferase. So both of them, they belong to class 2. So they are classified as transferases. So first, we have the aspartate aminotransferase or the AST. So the other name for that is SGOT or serum glutamic oxaloacetic transaminase and it has an easy number of 2.6.1.1. So the major tissue sources, we have the cardiac tissues, the liver, and skeletal tissues. And other sources, we have the kidneys, pancreas, and RBCs. And like your ALT, this AST is stable for 3 to 4 days at 4 degrees Celsius. And for the AST isoenzymes, we have the cytoplasm AST, which is the most predominant form in serum, and also we have the mitochondrial AST. So for the diagnostic significance of AST, this is particularly helpful in the evaluation of myocardial infarction, so together with CKMB, with LDH, and of course, the troponin I. Also, we have the hepatocellular disorders and skeletal muscle involvement. And the highest elevation of AST is found in acute viral hepatitis. And this AST is released to greater degree in chronic disorders of the liver, with progressive damage. And also, in addition to that, AST is also used for monitoring therapy for potentially hepatotoxic drugs. So if a person is taking drugs um, which are toxic to the liver, we can use AST to monitor the effect of that drug to the person. So a result of more than three times the upper limit of normal for the AST, it should signal cessation of therapy or the intake of these drugs. So aside from acute myocardial infarction, we also have several diseases that might cause increased AST levels. So we also have trichinosis. So this one, this is a parasitic disease caused by trichinella spiralis. So the trichinella spiralis, the larva of which dwells in the muscles. So that's why if there is a muscular distraction because of this parasite, then we could have an increased level of AST in the blood. Also, we have the dermatomyositis. So this dermatomyositis is an inflammation of the skin and the underlying muscle tissue. So it also involves the degeneration of collagen. So there will be discoloration and swelling in the skin. And also it occurs as an autoimmune condition or usually associated with internal cancers. Also, whenever there is muscular dystrophy, AST levels are expected to increase. And lastly, we have acute pancreatitis. So just a review, this AST in acute myocardial infarction, the levels of which rises within 6 to 8 hours, and it reaches its peak at 24 hours, and it returns to its normal or baseline level within 5 days. So for the AST measurement in particular, we have the Carmen method. So this is based on the principle which incorporates a coupled enzymatic reaction using this one, the malate dehydrogenase as the indicator reaction and monitors the change in absorbance at 340 nanometer continuously as this NADH is oxidized to NAD. 
So in this method, and also for other AST methods, you just have to remember that hemolysis should be avoided because it can dramatically increase the serum AST concentration. And again, this AST activity is stable in serum for 3 to 4 days at refrigerated temperature. So next one, we have the alanine aminotransferase. So for the other name, we have SGPT or the serum glutamic pyruvic transaminase. For the easy number, it's 2.6.1.2 and the major tissue source is the liver. So you just have to take note that your ALT is more liver specific as compared to your ALT. Next one, the other tissue sources, we have the kidneys, the pancreas, and the RBCs, also the heart, the skeletal muscles, and the lungs. And just like your AST, this one is also stable for 3 to 4 days at refrigerated temperature or at 4 degrees Celsius. And just take note that this one has an enzymatic activity similar to AST. And this ALT catalyzes the transfer of an amino group from alanine to alpha-ketoglutarate with the formation of glutamate and pyruvate. So let me just write that one. So again, this catalyzes the transfer of alanine. So we have here the L-alanine and alpha-ketoglutarate to glutamate and pyruvate. So that is your ALT. And next one for the diagnostic significance of ALT, it's for the evaluation of hepatic disorders because again, this is more liver specific as compared to your AST. And also, it's markedly increased in acute inflammatory conditions as compared to your AST. And it monitors the course of liver disease or hepatitis or the course of treatment of this disease and the effects of drug therapy, just like your AST. However, it's more sensitive and specific screening test for post-transfusion hepatitis or occupational toxic exposure compared to AST. And also, this one, this is included in the screening of blood donors. So as I have mentioned, the ALT catalyzes the transfer of an amino group from alanine to alpha-ketoglutarate with the formation of glutamate and pyruvate. And in the ALT determination method, it uses a coupled enzymatic reaction. So in this reaction, it uses lactate dehydrogenase as the indicator enzyme. Remember, in AST, malate dehydrogenase is used as an indicator enzyme. So this LD now as an indicator enzyme in the ALT determination will catalyze the reduction of pyruvate to lactate with a simultaneous oxidation of this NAD. And also, the change in absorbance at 340 nanometer, which is measured continuously, is directly proportional to ALT activity. So the following are the conditions in which we could see an increased ALT levels. So first, we have the toxic hepatitis. Also, we have the Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome. So this one, this is a condition in which there is an extra electrical pathway in the heart. So this is a disease in the heart, and this condition can lead to periods of rapid heart rate, or what we call as the tachycardia. And also, we have the chronic alcoholism, the hepatic cancer, and this one, the Reyes syndrome, which is a rare but serious condition that causes swelling in the liver and also the brain. And this disease often affects children and teenagers recovering from viral infection. So most commonly, when the children or teenagers recover from flu or chicken pox. And lastly, just like in your AST, we have viral hepatitis. So another one, we have the term here, the rightis ratio. So this is a ratio between the AST and ALT and it was named after Fernando de Raitis who performed the analysis on transaminases in 1957. So the normal de Raitis ratio according to International Federation of Clinical Chemistry is approximately 1.15. So 
for acute hepatitis wherein this is a condition wherein we can see the highest elevations of transferases, the deritis ratio is less than the normal value. So that's less than 1.0. So in severe viral or toxic hepatitis, it could produce elevations of transferases um, up to 20 times the normal limits. So that's why the highest elevations can be seen in acute hepatitis. However, in end-stage cirrhosis, so let me write that one. So end-stage cirrhosis, you have to take note that the, um, the, the levels of AST and ALT are not elevated. So generally, they are not elevated and may be low as a result of massive tissue destruction. So this one again, this might cause a low AST and ALT level. And also, the ALT is slightly increased in obstructive jaundice but markedly increased in necrotic jaundice. Next one, we have the enzyme amylase. So for the other names, we have the alpha-1,4, glucan-4, glucohydrolase, or simply diastase. The easy number of amylase is 3.2.1.1 and its function is it catalyzes the breakdown of starch and glycogen. So again, for the easy number, it belongs to class 3. So it is a type of hydrolase. And another one, this amylase is the smallest enzyme in size. So the molecular weight of this amylase is about 50,000 to 55,000 daltons. So because of that, it is normally filtered by the kidney. So it appears in the urine because of its small size. And what you need to remember is that the amylase is the earliest pancreatic marker because the major tissue source of this amylase is the pancreas, particularly the acinar cells of the pancreas and also the salivary gland. So that's why it is increased whenever there is a pancreatic disease. Next one, for the other tissue sources, we have the adipose tissues, fallopian tubes, small intestines, and skeletal muscles. And you have to take note that our normal serum contains both the salivary and pancreatic amylase because they are needed for the digestion of foods. So for the determination of amylase, basically we have four. So the amyloclastic, saccharogenic, chromogenic, and continuous monitoring. So for amyloclastic, it measures the disappearance of the substrate. So in this case, starch is used as a substrate. So the decrease in color... So in this case, the decrease in color, since we measure the disappearance of the substrate, so the decrease in color is directly proportional to the activity of amylase. Next one, saccharogenic method. So this measures the appearance of the product. So in saccharogenic method, the amount of reducing sugars is measured where the concentration of this reducing sugar is proportional to the activity of amylase. And also, in this case, the reference method for this one is the Somogi units. So again, the reference method using this saccharogenic method is the Somogi units. Next one, we have the chromogenic method. So this one measures the increasing color from production of product coupled with chromogenic dye. So increase in color intensity of the soluble dye substrate is directly proportional to amylase activity. And for continuous monitoring, we have the coupling um, of several enzyme systems to monitor the amylase activity. So for continuous monitoring um, method, the optimal pH is a pH of 6.9 at 340 nanometers. So for this one, for the continuous monitoring, we use starch as a substrate. So by the use of that starch as a substrate, we can form the carbohydrate maltose. So in the presence, of course, of the enzyme amylase. And that maltose, um, in the presence of alpha-glucosidase, so alpha-glucosidase will form now a glucose molecule. And in the presence of another enzyme, so we call it hexokinase, 
So in the presence of hexokinase, the glucose will be converted to 5-glucose-6-phosphate. And also, lastly, in the presence of G6PD, so G6PD, this glucose-6-phosphate will be reduced to NADH. And the change in absorbance, again, is measured to determine the amylase activity. So that's for the continuous monitoring method for amylase determination. So for the isoenzymes of amylase, we have the S-type and P-type, so deptialine and amylopsin respectively. And both of them are present in normal healthy sera. And in acute pancreatitis, the most predominant pancreatic amylase isoenzyme is the P3-type. So this belongs to the P-type, the amylopsin. So for the diagnostic significance, this amylase is helpful in the diagnosis of acute pancreatitis. So for this disease, the amylase level increases 2 to 12 hours after the onset of the disease. And it reaches its peak 24 hours after the onset and it returns to its normal level within 3 to 5 days. And also it is helpful in the detection of parotitis or the inflammation of our salivary gland usually because of mumps and other related conditions. And also... You have to take note that in acute pancreatitis, the amylase level in the blood, again, is increased. So, increased blood amylase. And also, this increased levels of amylase in the blood is accompanied by an increased urinary excretion of amylase. So, the amylase is also increased in urine. And the amylase in urine remains elevated for up to 7 days. So that is for acute pancreatitis. So let me just write here, seven days. Okay. Next one, if a patient has a renal failure, so this renal failure without acute pancreatitis. So without acute pancreatitis. So there is an increased amylase in the blood. However, the urine amylase is decreased. So there is a decrease amylase in the urine. So that's just to differentiate acute pancreatitis and the presence of renal failure. So just some notes to remember when we are talking about amylase. So salivary amylase is inhibited by wheat germ lectin so we should not use that for the analysis of this salivary amylase. And also we have a condition it is known as macroamylacemia. So this is a condition characterized by persistent elevation of serum amylase but in this case there is no apparent clinical symptoms of pancreatic disease so that is macroamylacemia so this macroamylacemia by itself is not a disease but it may be an early marker of pancreatic disease so in this condition the amylase complexes with immunoglobulins so its excretion will be prevented in the kidneys because once it is bound already to immunoglobulins, this small molecular weight amylase will now be large in size. So it will be too large to be filtered across the glomerulus. And for normal amylase creatinine ratio, it is 1 to 4%. And in acute pancreatitis, the AC ratio reaches up to 15% or it is greater than 4 or 4%. Next one, the heparin and triglycerides may inhibit amylase activity in some methods. And also, we have here the conditions in which we can see increased amylase levels. Acute pancreatitis again, in ectopic pregnancy, in peptic ulcer, in alcoholism, and of course, mumps which can cause the inflammation of our salivary glands. Next, we have the lipase. So the other name for this is triacylglycerol acyl hydrolase. And next one, the AC number is 3.1.1.3. And this lipase hydrolyzes the ester linkages of fats to produce alcohol and fatty acids. So this one is very important in the partial hydrolysis of dietary triglycerides in the intestine with the production, of course, of the long chains of fatty acids. And the major tissue source of lipase is the pancreas. 
and also this is considered as the most specific pancreatic marker. So it is considered as the most specific pancreatic marker because it is secreted exclusively in the pancreas. And unlike your amylase, it is not affected by renal disorders and the plasma concentration of this lipase are usually normal in conditions of salivary gland involvement. So that's for lipase. Because lipase is considered as the most specific pancreatic marker, it is very helpful in the diagnosis of acute pancreatitis. So in this case, um, in acute pancreatitis, the level of lipase increases 6 hours after the onset of the disease. And it reaches its peak 24 hours after and it remains elevated for 7 days and it returns to normal within 8 to 14 days. That's in acute pancreatitis. However, in chronic pancreatitis, there is a degradation of the acinar cells. So that now will result to a loss of amylase and lipase, decreasing their values. Next one, we have the method for lipase determination. So we have the cherry crandall method, which is considered as the reference method for lipase detection. So in this case, olive oil is used as a substrate. So that olive oil is hydrolyzed by lipase into monoglycerides and fatty acids. But we can also use this one, the triolein. This is a more form of triglyceride. And also, we have the Tate's and ferric method and the peroxidase coupling method, which is the most commonly used method. But again, the reference method is the cherry crandall method. Next, we have the LDH or the lactate dehydrogenase with an easy number of 1.1.1.27. So the easy class of that is class 1 enzyme. So that means this LDH is an oxidoreductase type of an enzyme. And also it's a zinc containing enzyme that is part of the glycolytic pathway and it is widely distributed because it is virtually found in all cells of the body. And it has um, a tetrameric molecule with four subunits and with two possible forms, the H and the M subunits. And in plasma, the majority of LDH, of course, comes from the breakdown of RBCs and platelets and, of course, with varying contributions from other organs because, again, this enzyme is widely distributed. So for the tissue sources of LDH, so for the LD1 and LD2, we have the heart, kidneys, and the RBCs. For the LD3, we have the lungs, the pancreas, and the spleen. And for LD4 and LD5, we have the skeletal muscles, the liver, and the intestine. And you have to take note that the red blood cells contain very high levels of LDH. That's why in the analysis, hemolysis must be avoided. Next one, we also have the isoenzymes of LDH. So generally, we have five. Again, it has two subunits, the H and the M. So for the LD1, it has 4H, so it is found in heart and RBCs. For LD2, it has 3H and 1M. So it's again found in heart and in RBCs. For LD3, it has 2H subunits and 2M subunits. So this is found in the lungs, lymphocytes, spleen, and pancreas. And next one, the LD4 has 3M subunits and 1H subunits. So this is primarily found in the liver. And for the LD5, it has this 4M subunits. So it is basically found in the skeletal muscles. So the most abundant subunits um, or the isoenzymes of LDH is the LD2. And this LD2 is also the major isoenzyme in the sera of healthy persons. So that's for the LDH isoenzymes. And another isoenzyme for LDH is the LD6. So this one, it represents the alcohol dehydrogenase enzyme. So this forms the sixth bond in electrophoresis. And this LD6, because it represents the alcohol dehydrogenase, it is elevated in drug hepatotoxicity and of course in obstructive jaundice. And next one, it is responsible for the metabolic conversion of methanol and ethylene glycol to toxic compounds. 
For the diagnostic significance of LDH, its highest level is found in pernicious anemia and also in some hemolytic disorders. So remember that pernicious anemia is a type of macrocytic anemia. So this means the RBCs of the patient having pernicious anemia are large in size. And take note that this LDH is found abundantly inside of the RBC. So that explains why its highest elevation is seen in pernicious anemia and some hemolytic disorders. Also, in hepatic carcinoma and toxic hepatitis, the LDH will have a tenfold increase. However, for the viral hepatitis and cirrhosis, it's slightly increased. It's two to three times the upper reference limit. Next one, the LD2, 3, and 4 also serve as LD cancer markers. And predominantly, LD3 can be found in acute leukemia, germ cell tumors, breast, and lung cancers. And for LD5, um, it is moderately increased in acute viral hepatitis and cirrhosis, but it's markedly increased in carcinoma and in toxic hepatitis. So that's for LD5. Next one, for the normal pattern of LDH in serum, so the value of LD2 is greater than LD1, LD3, LD4, and LD5 in serum. However, you have to take note that in some disease state, particularly in myocardial infarction and hemolytic anemia, LD1 is greater than LD2. So that is what we call as the flipped pattern. So the LD2 and LD1 ratio rises to greater than 0 0.75 and often exceeds 1, which occurs only about 36 hours after the onset of the symptoms. And also, for acute myocardial infarction, the LDH increases 12 to 24 hours after the onset of disease and it reaches its peak 48 to 72 hours and it remains elevated 10 to 14 days after. However, um, you have to take note also that an elevated total LDH is non-specific, although it has a lot of clinical significance. So, the elevated total LDH is not specific because it is present um, from all several tissues. Again, as what I have mentioned, LDH is widely distributed. So, just some notes to remember when we are talking about LDH. So, the LDH activity in pleural fluids is useful for differentiating transudates and exudates. So, in transudates, we could commonly observe that there is a low LDH level, whereas in exudates, there is a high exudate level because this transudate is usually clear and free of cells. So that's for transudates. However, the exudate has a high content of cells and also cellular debris and other proteins. That's why it contains a high level of LDH. And also, the total LD increases temporarily after blood transfusion but returns to baseline within 24 hours. That's because of the transfusion of RBCs to the patient from a different donor. Next one, the samples should be processed within 24 hours after collection and stored at 25 degrees Celsius. And we could see decreased LDH when samples are frozen because LD5 um, subunit is a cold labile isoenzyme. Next one, these are the conditions with increased LDH. So we have the anemia such as, again, pernicious anemia. We have hemolytic anemia and megaloblastic anemia. So we also have myocardial infarction. We have leukemia, renal infarction, hepatitis and hepatic cancer, muscular dystrophy, delirium tremens and malignancy. And of course, the pneumocystis gerovesii. So this is formerly known as pneumocystis carinae. So this is common in patients who have HIV or AIDS. So for LDH determination, we have the Walker method and the rublewski ladue method. So both of them uses zinc as their cofactor. So for the Walker method, this is considered as the forward or direct method. So that's for Walker. For rublewski ladue this is the reverse or the indirect method for the determination of LDH.
So just like your ALP, the isoenzymes of your LDH can also be separated through electrophoretic methods. So in this case, as what you can see here, um, among the five isoenzymes of LDH, it's the LD1 that is the fastest to migrate towards the anode. So it's the most anodal, whereas the LDH5 is the least anodal. So this is the origin. So before that is the alcohol dehydrogenase, the LD6. So it's still the slowest because it stays in the origin. And also, we could see here the densitometric patterns of LDH isoenzymes in normal and in patient's serum. So for the normal serum, again, the LD2 is higher in value as compared to LD1. So that's why we could see here a thicker um, densitometry pattern of LD2 as compared to LD1. However, in acute myocardial infarction, we could see a flipped pattern. Now, the LD1 is increased as compared to the LD2 level. So that is why we could see here a thick pattern of LD1. And in acute hepatitis, what is the striking pattern is there is an increased level of LDH5 isoenzyme. So just like this one also. Next enzyme, we have the creatine kinase. So this CK, it has an easy number of 2.7.3.2. So that means it belongs to class 2 and it is a transferase. So the other name for this is ATP creatine and phosphotransferase. And it catalyzes the transfer of a phosphate group between creatine phosphate and ADP. And it is involved in the storage of high energy phosphate in the muscles. So that's why this CK is very abundant in our muscle tissues. And for the major tissue source, we have the brain and the muscles, particularly the skeletal and cardiac muscles. So this CK is found only in small amounts throughout the body and its high concentrations again can be found in the muscles and of course in the brain. And also you have to remember that the CK from the brain will never cross the blood-brain barrier to reach the plasma. And another one, this CK requires magnesium as its cofactor. Next one, the CK is a very sensitive indicator of acute myocardial infarction and the shin disorders. Again, because the CK is very abundant in heart muscles and also in the skeletal muscles. So its highest elevation is seen in the shin's muscular dystrophy. So it's 50 times compared to the upper reference limit. And also, you have to take note that the liver and the RBCs do not contain creatine kinase. So these are the isoenzymes for CK. So we have the CK1 or the CKBB. So this is an isoenzyme in the brain. We have CK2, the hybrid type. It has two subunits, the CK, M, and B. So this is particularly useful in the diagnosis of acute myocardial infarction together with AST and LDH. Next one, we have the CK3, the muscle type. So it has two M subunits. For CK1 or the CKBB isoenzyme, this is the most anodal. So it's the fastest to migrate towards the anode. And as opposed to that, the CK3 is the least anodal. And also, the adult serum rarely contains the CKBB of the brain origin due to its high molecular weight. So this one, it has a high molecular weight that it cannot cross the blood-brain barrier. However, it may be normally present in the serum of the neonates. And this CK1 or the CKBB, aside from being the dominant isoenzyme in the brain, it's also found in the intestine and also in the smooth muscles. So that's for the CK1. Next one, we have the CKMB or the CK2. So the cardiac tissues have significant amount of this one, so about 20%. And the serum of healthy person contains at least okay, less than 5 micrograms per liter of CKMB. And as what I have mentioned again, this is primarily used to detect acute myocardial infarction. And you have to take note that the myocardium is the only tissue source from which the CKMB enters the serum in significant quantities. So for the diagnosis of AMI, so the CKMB usually increase 
4 to 8 hours after the onset of acute myocardial infarction. And next one, it reaches its peak 12 to 24 hours after and it normalizes 48 to 72 hours after. But you have to take note that CKMB is not elevated in angina. So let me write that one. Not elevated usually whenever there is angina. And also, there is um, some claim that um, would say that in order to increase the sensitivity and specificity of CKMB in the diagnosis of acute myocardial infarction, it has been found to um, necessarily perform serial determinations of CKMB fractions, so at 3 to 4 hours interval. So that's over a 12 to 16 hours period. So that is just to increase the sensitivity of CKMB. So this one shows a progressive rise that reaches a peak followed by a fall to a low levels. So next one, we have the CK3 or the CKMM. So this is the major isoenzyme of creatinine kinase in sera of healthy persons, which is about 94 to 100%. And when a person has this intramuscular injection, so it would increase the CK level about five times the upper reference limit. And for bedridden patient, because their muscles are no longer active, they will have a decreased creatinine kinase of the CK3 isoenzyme type. So um, for physically well-trained individuals, so they tend to have elevated baseline levels of total CK because again, the CKMM is abundantly found in the muscles. And also, if there is injury to cardiac or skeletal muscles, so that would account for an increased CKMM elevations. And majority of the CKMM elevation is because of the injury to this cardiac or skeletal muscles. And also, we could see uh, mild elevations other than intramuscular injections. So there is also mild elevations in cases of muscle trauma, like in sports or a person um, tend to have a strenuous activity or maybe after a surgery. So that will increase the CK3 isoenzyme. Next one, we have the aldolase. So the other name for this is fructose 1,6-diphosphate aldolase with an easy number of 4.1.2.13. So it's 4, so it belongs to lyases. So this is an enzyme responsible for the breakdown of glucose products into energy specifically converting fructose 1,6-diphosphate into two triose phosphate molecules in the metabolism of glucose. And this test is done to diagnose or to monitor liver or muscle damage because the highest level of aldolase is seen in skeletal muscles or in liver. So this aldolase test is no longer used routinely. However, it may be ordered if the patients have muscular dystrophy or dermatomyositis. So let me write that one. So muscular dystrophy or the other one is dermatomyositis. So when we say muscular dystrophy, this is a group of inherited diseases that damage and weaken the muscles over time. And this damage and weakness is due to the lack of protein we call as dystrophin. And this dystrophin is necessary for normal muscle function. And the absence of this protein can cause problems with walking, swallowing, and muscle coordination. Just like in Duchenne's muscular dystrophy when we discussed about the creatinine kinase enzyme. And also, um, this enzyme is found abundant again in skeletal muscle. So, we can find its elevation in skeletal muscle diseases, in leukemia, in hemolytic anemia, and in hepatic cancer. And since this aldolase is abundantly found in skeletal muscles, exercise can affect the aldolase test results. So, it could cause falsely elevated results. So, the patients must be instructed to be on a normal activity and avoid strenuous exercise to avoid this false elevation of aldolase. And since um, also it's found abundantly in the muscles, it can be tested together with other enzymes such as the CK, 
the ALT, and of course, the AST. And for aldolase isoenzymes, we have three. So we have aldolase A, B, and C. So for the aldolase A, it's abundant in skeletal muscles. For B, it's in WBC, liver, and kidneys. And for C, it's abundant in brain tissues. Next, we have other clinically significant enzymes. So first, we have 5 nucleotidase. So with an easy number of 3.1, 0.3, 0.5. So that means this is a phosphoric monoester hydrolase. It belongs to class 3. And this is predominantly secreted by the liver. And it is a marker for hepatobiliary disease and also for the infiltrative lesions of the liver and of course for cholestasis. So the function of this 5 nucleotidase is to create a molecule of adenosine. So it creates adenosine from adenosine monophosphate. And remember, this adenosine is important for numerous biological functions including energy production and signaling. And the main reason why there is an increased level of 5 nucleotidase is the blockage of the hepatobiliary tract. So again, when we say hepatobiliary tract, it's the passageway connecting the liver, the duodenum, and the gallbladder. So that's why your 5 nucleotidase is a marker for hepatobiliary disease. And also, this may indicate cholestasis or there is a decrease in the bile flow due to impaired secretion by the hepatocytes or to the obstruction of bile flow through the intra or extra hepatic bile ducts. And for the method, we have Dixon and Perdon, we have Campbell, we have Belfield and Goldberg. Next one, we have the GGT or the gamma glutamyl transamine peptidase or transferase. So it has an easy number of 2.3.2.2. So that means it is a transferase. So this is located in the canaliculi of the hepatic cells and particularly in the epithelial cells lining the biliary ductules and also in the kidneys, the prostate, and the pancreas. And this GGT is elevated among individuals undergoing warfarin, phenobarbital, and phenytoin therapies. And this is also used to determine the cause of elevated alkaline phosphatase. So if both the ALP and GGT are elevated, so that means there is a disease in the liver or bile duct disorders. But if only ALP is elevated, that indicates bone disorders. Therefore, if the GGT level is normal in a person with high um, ALP, so if GGT is normal and the ALP is high, so this means the disease is a type of a bone disease. For the measurement of GGT, we have the SAS method or the SAS assay. And the measurement is commonly done at 405 to 420 nanometer. And the GGT is measured by the addition of 10% sodium hydroxide. So for the diagnostic significance, GGT is elevated in hepatobiliary disorders, particularly if there is biliary tract obstruction. And it is a sensitive indicator of occult alcoholism and is considered as the most sensitive marker of acute alcoholic hepatitis. It's a sensitive indicator because even small amounts of alcohol within 24 hours of a GGT test may cause a temporary increase in the GGT. And also, it is useful in monitoring the effects of abstention from alcohol. And not only that, your GGT is also increased in pancreatitis and prostatic disorders. Next one, we have the cholinesterase. So we have two types, the pseudocholinesterase found in the liver and the acetylcholinesterase found in the nerve tissues and the RBCs. And there are two reasons why cholinesterase testing is done. So first is to detect pesticide poisoning. So pesticide poisoning. And the other one is during the post-operative paralysis or if someone is at risk of having post-operative paralysis, especially whenever succinylcholine is used in the operation. So succinylcholine. So for pesticide poisoning, so this is very helpful 
to monitor someone who are at risk of exposure to organophosphate compounds such as those who work in agricultural or chemical industries and also to monitor those who are being treated for exposure. So both the RBC acetylcholinesterase and the serum pseudocholinesterase are helpful in this case. And also for post-operative paralysis. So this um, pseudocholinesterase in particular can be used um, several days prior to a surgical procedure to determine if someone with a history of or a family history of post-operative paralysis following the use of succinylcholine is at risk of having this reaction, this post-operative paralysis. And take note that this succinylcholine is a common muscle relaxant that is usually used for anesthesia. So for this purpose, again, it's the pseudocholinesterase that is more useful. For cholinesterase measurement, we have the Michael method, which measures the acetic acid, and the Elman method, which measures the choline. Next one, we have the ACE or angiotensin converting enzyme. For the easy number, it's 3.4.15.1. So this means this is a type of hydrolase. The other name is peptidyl dipeptidase A or kinase 2. And it converts angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2 in the lungs. So remember, this is very important in the activation of RAAS or the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. And also, it's a possible indicator of neuronal dysfunction, particularly if a person has Alzheimer's disease. And it is a critical target for inhibitory drugs designed to lower the BP because, again, ACE increases the blood pressure. Next one, for the tissue sources, we have the lungs, the testes, macrophages, and the epitheloid cells. Also, for the diagnostic significance, it is useful for the diagnosis and monitoring of sarcoidosis. So sarcoidosis is an inflammatory disease that affects multiple organs in the body, but mostly in the lungs and also your lymph glands. And in people with sarcoidosis, abnormal masses or nodules, we call it as granuloma. So granuloma, and this consists also of inflamed tissues, are formed again in sarcoidosis, and they are formed in certain organs of the body. And these granulomas may alter the normal structure and possibly the function of the affected organs. And also, aside from sarcoidosis, you have multiple sclerosis, Addison's disease, acute and chronic bronchitis, HIV infection, and of course, leprosy. And lastly, we have the seroluplasmin. So with an easy number of 1.16.3.1. So this means this is an oxidoreductase enzyme. So this is a copper-carrying protein, which is a marker for Wilson's disease, which is a type of hepatolenticular disease. I know you have learned a lot of this one in clinical chemistry one. So that ends my discussion. Thank you.